We're now going to look at some contemporary theologians, uh, two of my favorites, N.C. Wright and Jürgen Moltmann, and we're going to look at where do they agree, and I'll try to say this briefly and sum this up so that we can stay room for questions um, and comments. There's six areas of agreement. The first area is the idea of um, the primacy of Jewish eschatology. There's so much that can be said. Chapter five of the book really gets into it and maps out um, item by item of, of this. Um, basically, both Moltmann and Wright are building their vision of Christian eschatology from Jewish eschatology. Um, Moltmann talks a lot about resurrection um, uh, as a salvific hope and uh, judgment. Uh, he talks also about creation that began in time and is completed in space. Moltmann uses these concepts of a great Sabbath and a great Shekinah. The glory of God will descend upon the world, the great Shekinah of God, and the great um, Sabbath of God when creation will find its true rest. Um, right talks about kind of how actually it looks different than 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 what Jewish people would have imagined. In fact, they thought of a resurrection as happening at the end of time for everyone. But here, Jesus, one person in advance of everyone else, receives resurrection. That That's an interesting uh, development. And he talks about kind of three different positions regarding the afterlife that, that the Old Testament um, kind of proposes. And uh, there, there's so much here that we can't fully... Uh, dive into, but just to say that Wright does a lot of work to show that the Christian vision of resurrection could not have emerged automatically from Jewish theology. So even though it can't, it comes from Jewish eschatology uh, more than anyone else. And in fact, sometimes critics say, "Oh, it's from ancient Zoroastrianism or Canaanite mythology." And Wright says, "No, no, no. You don't understand how important resurrection language was to Jewish eschatology." It, it symbolized the return of Israel to the promised land um, after exile. So there's a lot of this imagery of, of sin equals death and exile, and return from exile equals resurrection. You see this, by the way, when Jesus is telling the story of the prodigal son, and he says, my son who was dead is now alive. That, that's kind of an idea uh, of, of Israel in exile and then come back. Resurrection equals the return from exile, the forgiveness of sins and all that. But again, no one imagined that one person in advance of everyone else, the Messiah would suffer, die and be raised up. So it draws on it and yet is different from it. And so for both Moltmann and Wright, the centrality of Christ's resurrection is the key. Jesus's resurrection kind of becomes the means and the model of all things. In fact, Moltmann says, Christianity stands or falls with the reality of the raising of Jesus from the dead by God. Everything rises and falls on uh, the resurrection. Everything gets read through that, gets interpreted uh, through that. Uh, right, turning to Pauline theology, Paul's theology, um, says that you cannot understand what happened to make Jewish hope into Christian hope, how the Christian vision of the end changes. You, you can't even begin to imagine that if Jesus himself had not been raised from the dead. And so Wright makes this fantastic argument in his thick book, Resurrection and the Son of God, that the only way we arrive at the Christian vision of hope is because Jesus himself was actually raised from the dead. And this, of course, is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. So, Okay, we'll have to speed up a little bit. The paradigm for the resurrection of the dead. And so when we want to know, well, what is our resurrection going to be like? We have to say, well, we look back at Jesus as uh, not only central to our co uh, concept of hope, but actually paradigmatic. He is the paradigm for understanding the resurrection of the dead. I, there's a great quote from Moltmann. Moltmann says, the immortality of the soul is an opinion. And basically, it was Plato's opinion. It was a Greek theory. But the resurrection of the dead is a hope. I love that. Moltmann is saying, look, the first is a trust in just the nature of human beings, that, oh, we're immortal, and so the soul will live on. But Jewish people did not believe that. Christians did not believe in an immortal soul. In fact, in the New Testament, it says, to the only immortal God. Um, this, we, we are not immortal. We live forever because we are in Christ who lives forever. So Moltmann says the belief in an immort 
immortal soul, that, that's a trust in the nature of human, the, the human being. But resurrection from the dead, that's a hope that comes from trust in the God who calls into being the things that are not and makes the dead live. What a sentence from Moltmann. And of course, right. Uh, has said uh, similar things. Wright's thesis on the redemption of our bodies is simply this. The risen Jesus is both the model for the Christian's future body and the means by which it comes about. So when you want to know, well, well, will, will, our, will it be this body that gets changed? Yes. Look at Jesus. It was his actual body that had the scars in it that was transformed by resurrection. So that's how we think about our own resurrected bodies. Uh, fourthly, the paradigm of the renewal of creation. So the resurrection of Jesus is also how we think about new creation. Will creation be destroyed? Yes. Will creation be renewed and become new creation? Yes. You're like, well, how? Think about Jesus who died and was raised up. So the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus actually become a paradigm for understanding the renewal of creation itself. So if people only emphasize one thing or the other, they, they'll get it wrong. If they only say, oh, we're going into a new creation as if God is going to create a new planet and a new galaxy and a new cosmos, that, that is missing the mark. That, that's not what the New Testament says. But if they say, oh, the earth is going to burn, it's going to destroy, who cares about creation care and stewardship? It doesn't matter. No, no, no. Don't you see that Jesus's body bears the scars from his crucifixion? Now, I don't know what that means for creation, but it does make you wonder, what if our scars on creation will still be there in the new creation and our stewardship of this creation will show up in the new creation? I don't know. But the end of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about resurrection so much in the return of Christ, he says, nothing we do in the Lord will be in vain. So there is a continuity between this creation and the next. Somehow the work echoes into it. Again, I cannot say how. I do not know how exactly. But Christ's own death and resurrection is a paradigm for that. Both Wright and Moltmann agree on the insufficiency of secular and modern Christian eschatologies. We'll talk about some of those in a moment. The insufficiency of secular and modern Christian eschatology. And finally, both Wright and Moltmann believe that if you get your eschatology right, you'll get the mission of the church right. There's so much that can be said here. Listen, American evangelicalism, because they thought that our hope was the immortal soul going to heaven as opposed to hell, has made the mission of the church saving souls. And meanwhile, we've left systems of injustice and wickedness intact because we thought, eh, who cares? But if you understand that our Christian hope is that the kingdom of God is going to arrive on earth as it is in heaven and all things will be made new and renewed, then the mission of the church is, yes, evangelism and the announcement of the forgiveness of sins, and it is justice, and it is service, and it is care for creation. It is all of those things. Why? Because if our hope is resurrection and new creation, then our mission is much more than saving souls. Man, I could preach on this for a long time, but this is what really changes our paradigm. This, and both Wright and Moltmann are strong about this. If you get your eschatology wrong, if you get your vision of hope wrong, you get your mission of the church wrong. If we are immortal souls gonna, that are going to fly away to heaven, then who really cares about racism or, 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 or violence or abortion? Or, who, who cares as long as we get souls saved? But if you understand that the, mission, that the Christian hope is for... Uh, the reign of God to arrive in such a way that renews uh, all things, then the mission of the church is meant to anticipate that even now. Christians sing. In dark prison cells and in weekly worship, when hearts are buoyant and when all seems lost, Christians sing. This is what we do. And Christians sing because we are people of hope. But what kind of hope is it? And what exactly are we singing about when we experience this hope? Worship in the World to Come is a book that's been seven years in the making. It captures the essence of my doctoral research on how Christian hope is encoded in the contemporary worship songs that we sing and experienced in the worship services that we participate in. 
And the book is divided into four sections. The first section is kind of sets the stage. It explores a little bit about what practical theology is and this model of putting together theory and practice. And then it looks at three contemporary paradigms of congregational worship. What are three contemporary ways of thinking about what the church is doing when it gathers together in worship? The next section is all about hope. Hope from various perspectives, from the cognitive and emotional, uh, from the philosophical to the theological. And then we move to part three, which is all about the songs and services that we participate in, evangelicals and Christian hope. The final section of the book is about the Holy Spirit and the church. How is it that the Holy Spirit is at work as we worship, giving us a foretaste of the future now, empowering us with a sense of agency? So join me in this exploration of hope and worship. Pick up your copy of Worship in the World to Come.